Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 40 of the Camino Voice. On this episode, I speak to the founder of Forte MDA. Please welcome Chris Tui. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Camino Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, it's Brandon with the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. Uh, on this episode, I speak with Chris Tui, and this is happening during the whole coronavirus thing going on right now. So we had to do our interview over Skype. Um, but I had a great conversation with Chris. I got to hear a lot about his uh, art background, but he's he's not just doing like art or just music or just dance. He's doing all three of them. He's trained in all three of them and uh, continues to learn more about each one. But uh, he's had a really fascinating journey of moving around, uh, running into different jazz legends and um, being able to study at fantastic schools like Juilliard. And uh, anyways, really fascinating conversation with him. The other thing is that his studio is located at the same location that the little store by the bay used to be located. So um, anyways, we talk a little bit about that. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoy my conversation with Chris Tui. Hey, Islanders, it's Brandon with the Camino Voice. And today I'm here with the founder of Forte MDA, Chris Tui. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Appreciate it. So before we get started with all the questions, uh, tell us a little bit about Chris. Well, um, I was born in Seattle and uh, grew up in um, Oregon and Mont Angel, a small town, until I was uh, you know, in the seventh grade. Then went up to Oak Harbor for a year and then down to Mercer Island and was there until I graduated from high school. Okay. And... Uh, so that kind of gives you the, the the places I've been. All right, very cool. Um, so you said you you were born in Seattle, but then you moved around. Where did you you spent most of your growing up time then, or where was that? In in Mon Angel from from the time I was just a kid to you know uh, I think I was probably about a year old to the seventh grade. Uh, and then moved up to uh, to uh, Woodby Island. My dad passed away when he was 24, so my mom was sort of being told what to do by by uh, family and and uh, friends and stuff. And so we were in a pro- the projects in Seattle, and she decided that she was just going to pack us up and go to Mon Angel, which is where my dad and my mom were going to do a a marriage encounter. So she had that in mind, and so she just packed us up and and left so people couldn't influence her as to what to do with her three boys so she had when when he died my brother my older brother was two and i was a year old and my younger brother was two weeks old oh my word what i mean i don't yeah how did that happen he was you said he was 24 yeah 24 years old he had uh rheumatic fever when he was a kid and so he had some complications because of that but what actually happened was when he was in the hospital uh the nurses changed shifts and one came in to give him his medication and this was in the days when they had the the oxygen mask that went over the nose and the mouth so she took it off and she broke it and he suffocated oh my word yeah so, okay. Uh, so, but my mom, you know, wasn't even old enough to get into a bar, and she had three boys, you know, so that was a, a handful for her. Wow. And so she raised all three of you then on her own? Until we were, yeah, until we were teenagers. Uh, and then she remarried when we were, you know, young adults. And uh, and then I have two from that marriage, my my stepfather was 49, and he was thinking we were his family, the three boys. Yeah. And lo and behold, by the time he was 51, he had two girls of his own. <laughs> oh, okay. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So, so are they still yeah. in Seattle? My my sisters? or oh, uh, Yeah, or? The sisters and, like, family. And, like, is oh, your well, most of your family around here, or are they well, about? My brother. My older brother's in uh, Gold Bar, 
uh, with his family. And then I, my younger brother lives in, has lived in Switzerland, you know, for, you know, 30 years. Something wow. Like that. What's <laughs> he doing so there? He, uh, he was a busker and he, you know, uh, did, uh, he had like this little puppet show that he put together that had Blanchette puppets. Okay. So they're, they were strung up the middle. So they're sort of a Renaissance kind of a puppet. And he was able to string those to his guitar. He made a stage and he, and he had them, uh, had taps on their shoes and he would string <laughs> those to the, to the guitar, to the, both ends of the guitar. And then he had a foot pedal too. So he was able to manipulate the, the puppets as he was singing and, and, uh, uh, you know, he had like a little show and, and of course the kids would not walk by without looking at that. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, so, so he did, he did quite well as a busker. He's, he's retired from that now, but, but he did that for a long, long time. Okay. And so then how did he get, end up in Switzerland? Well, he was, um, traveling around, uh, he kind of, uh, had some, some uh, difficulties in the States and he felt like he just needed to make a change. So he was traveling, uh, in Europe and ended up in Switzerland and, um, uh, and, uh, a lady saw his, his show and they kind of got together afterwards, I guess. And, and, uh, uh, so he married a Swiss lady and then he had two Swiss cheesy babies <laughs> and who are, who are, who are adults now and have babies of their own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> yeah, so that's how he ended up there. Okay. And, uh, and he loves it there. So he's, and, and with everything going on here in the States with, with Trump and everything, I think he's quite happy to be there. Yep. <laughs> very cool. And so then what about your sisters? Where do they end up? Well, they, both of them actually are, are deceased now. So, oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, they were much younger than us. The, the boys, because uh, we were teenagers when they were born. But, but uh, yeah, so unfortunately, they're no longer with us. And my mom is still alive, and she lives down in Lacey. Okay. Uh, it's called Bonaventure down there. So uh, so my dad died when he was 93. His, his brother and his dad died of emphysema when they were in their 60s. But my dad, I think what kept him alive was having those two girls, and he lived to be 93. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then, so you were, I mean, you look, sounds like you moved around a lot. Um, so like in high school or junior high and high school, were you kind of already leaning towards like the arts, like music and dance and things like that? Or was, um, was that something that evolved over time? Well, my my grandmother was a pianist and a, a organist, and she kind of influenced uh, you know all of her kids. She had seven kids, and and then all of those ki- uh, all of her kids, you know, had lar- some of them had fairly large families, and they they all uh, you know were involved in music too. So so my mom played the piano and a number of other instruments. She plays the harp. She she still plays the harp now. And, okay. Uh, okay. But. Um, so we had a piano in the house, so that was probably the first, I mean, the first instrument when I could, when I could, was big enough to crawl up on the piano bench was the piano. And then my mom bought me a clarinet when I was in the fourth grade and, and when we were in Mont Angel. And, uh, you know, she got, she didn't know what to do. I mean, she bought it, she had no money and she bought it from a pawn shop and and it was missing keys and you know <laughs> had holes in it and stuff but somehow i figured out how to how to you know i i never had any lessons so i had to kind of figure out by ear how to play this thing and i was having to sort of do alternate fingerings and things to get the same sound <laughs> as the people that were playing next to me were doing. <laughs> So, but I believe it or not, I, I kept, I don't know what made me keep going with it because it was, you know, I mean, it was, it was tough, you know, but I, I kept playing and it wasn't until I was in high school that I got a, uh, a clarinet that was, you know, had all the keys on it and, you know, didn't have all the holes in it and stuff, you know. <laughs> were, you think, so, were you thinking, this is so much easier now? Yeah, I was thinking this, but, but, you know. 
I, I have to say, because I improvise pretty well by, by ear, and I have to say that part of the reason that I can do that the way I do is because I had to listen to everything and, and try to, you know, uh, play it without knowing how to read or anything, you know? Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until I was in, you know, high school that I started learning how to read, but but uh, but it, it was part of the reason that I can improvise the way I do was this was the, the misfortune of having a clarinet that didn't play. <laughs> wow, that's awesome, though. But guess, guess what? That was my major instrument, Collie. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so. oh, OK, so then, uh, yeah, tell us about that. So after you graduated high school, where did you end up going to college? So right out of high school, I graduated from Mercer Island High School, by the way, and uh, I was in the jazz band there in the concert band, too. I played sax in the jazz band and clarinet in the concert band. Uh, but uh, I, I auditioned at Cornish School of Allied Arts in Capitol Hill, and uh, I was able to get in not because I was, was really proficient at classical music, and Dr. Friedman was the director of the music department at the time, and he uh, auditioned me, but they, he had the foresight to bring in Jim Knapp, James Knapp from Chicago, to start a jazz program. And the reason I got in was because I play, you know, my, I was not a cl- classical musician. I was primarily, you know, playing rock and 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 jazz okay so so i got into that program there and uh i i ended up uh getting involved in it my girlfriend was a dancer and i ended up getting involved in a uh beginning adult class i thought well i'll surprise her you know because i could get a, an elective and it was a way of exercising because yeah. i wasn't doing anything so i thought well i'll do this and i'll kind of surprise her so i I'll have a better understanding of what we're or what we're looking at when we go to see the ballets and the modern dance companies and stuff. So, so anyway, uh, to, to, by the end of that year, the director of the dance department came and looked at the class, and she she asked you know she asked me if I would come to her office after uh, or the next day, and I said oh, okay. Then I didn't know what she was wanting me to go in there for, yeah. right? Yeah. But she she uh, offered me a position as an apprentice with the Cornish Ballet Company. And I had to I had to kind of think that over a bit because I was there to be a musician, not, a, you know, get involved with the, the dance department. But yeah. I, I ended up, a lot of musicians, the whole disco thing was happening. A lot of musicians were out of out of uh, work and they were in need of male dancers okay. so I I ended up becoming an apprentice and then I was a member of the, the Cornish Ballet Company and within two years I was on the stage in the Opera House which is where we actually graduated from high school was the Opera House at the C- C- uh, Seattle Center oh very which, cool and uh, so I was performing there with the Seattle Sym- Symphony and going wow how did I get here you know <laughs> And so then I did a study abroad program at the Centre de Dance International in Southern France and continued my dance studies there and also studied piano there. And, uh, and then came back to the States. I did some musical theater to save money and got my equity card before I went to New York and went to New York and I auditioned for Juilliard and I got a scholarship to Juilliard. <clears throat> wow. So how did you, so wait, so you said you studied abroad in France. How long were you living there? I was there for one year. At the end of the year, I was offered a job with the uh, Norwegian Opera Ballet Company. And I, I went up to check out the company, and I could see that, you know, I mean, I was really green because I, I hadn't been dancing. That wasn't like, the you know, most people start dancing when they're, you know, very young. So I started late. But I went up, and, and the, the company was really a good company, and I... Uh, I felt like I needed more training and uh, to take on something like that. So I knew that I wanted to come back to the States and go to New York. So, so that's what, what, what I did. Okay. And, uh, and that kind of paid off getting into Juilliard. It was pretty amazing. <clears throat> Very cool. So how did you end up getting a scholarship? Like, was that through dance or was that through music? That was, that was through dance. Okay. Yeah. It was through dance. Yeah. So, uh, so <laughs> 
pretty amazing. And then after I graduated from that, I was touring around with various companies, you know, all around the world. And and uh, uh, that wasn't the end of my studies, though. You know, I, I still continued on with that. Um, I ended up getting into UNLV in the, the music department there and was playing in the jazz department. And uh, I also studied at Clark County Community College. And I also did, uh, this was uh, graduate studies at the University of Maryland in the music department there, too. So, you know, that was Chris Vidala's band. He's a saxophone player for Chuck Mangione. Okay. And he had a great jazz band. And I, I played baritone sax in that band. Wow. Yeah. So, so, um, so if I'm hearing this right, so after you went to Juilliard, um, you actually came back and you did other studies, like you you went to the community college and um, the Clark community. You said, yeah, Clark uh, Community College is in Las Vegas, Las <laughs> and then Vegas, I went okay. to UNLV is the university there, and so I went to the university first, and then I went to Clark County uh, Community College, and uh, and then finished up my music studies at the university. I was doing graduate studies at the University of Maryland uh, in uh, Maryland. Very cool. So what was it like to, I mean, that's, that's quite the transition from Juilliard to start going back to a community college. Like, was that really different for you or were, did you feel pretty comfortable making all that, those transitions? Well, the, the Clark County Community College was a, uh, uh, I was involved in the music there and there was a wonderful guy who's a bebop piano player who uh, was was uh, you know teaching there at the time and there was there was he was teaching a composition class so I wanted to take that class so I could you know learn more about writing and I knew he was really good his name was Tom Ferguson okay and, uh, but in the class there was all these amazing people. And I had a rose garden in Las Vegas, and I was make I was like creating these incredible Mr. Lincolns that were huge. You know, I mean, they were award-winning flowers. <laughs> so there was a guy in the class that saw that I had these flower magazines. He says, "Oh, are you into flowers?" And I said, "Yeah, I've got a rose garden," and and he said, "I I do too." Now it turned out, that, and so he invited me over to his house went over there, went walking down the hallway. There was these photographs of jazz musicians all the way down the hallway. And at the end was a, a picture of uh, Charlie Parker, Chet Baker, and somebody playing bass. <laughs> well, the somebody playing bass was him, Carson Smith. Oh, and so wow. The whole, the whole day turned into like a, a, a you know, music history, you know, <laughs> afternoon. And he ended up taking that photograph off, the, which I have in my music studio. I took it off the wall and said to my dear friend Chris, and uh, and g- gave it to me. Oh, so and cool! It, and it was an original. Wow! You know, so, so so it was pretty amazing. And uh, so yeah, so we became buddies, not really because of the, con- but it, he was always writing incredible stuff. So I was I was. Always curious to to see what he would come up with. So, yeah. Uh, so so at Clark County Community College, you know, was actually wonderful for for that because of the the person that was there teaching at the time. Yeah. Uh, um, Ferguson. So I, I was seeking out people like that, you know, and uh, and so it was a much better experience for me actually there than it was for me. Because I played in some ensembles and stuff there too, a big band and a small ensembles, but it was a much better experience for me there than it was at UNLV. Okay. Wow. So then, so during this time, then, what are the degrees that by the time you graduated at UNLV, what was your kind of list of degrees that you had uh, completed? I have a, a bachelor of arts in music and dance. Okay. So, so I have a double, double major. Okay. Double, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and some of it I just did not necessarily because I wanted credits or anything. I was just doing it because I wanted knowledge. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, okay. So once you graduated from UNLV, where, what happened next? Uh, I didn't graduate from UNLV. Oh, so, okay. So, so I, uh, I just, I was, 
and their program, part of their program there. When I went to to Vegas, one of the reasons I went to Vegas was because I knew I could I could possibly get a gig as a musician and make a decent living. Well, you know, I was dancing in shows there. I did a bunch of shows there, and primarily dancing and singing in some of them too. Yeah. But uh, but and then I had a band there too for seven and a half years. But but. Um, you know, I, I was I was there just uh, to. I knew that UNLV was connected to some of these bands that were working on the strip, and people, you know, back in the, that that particular time was just the end of the mafia era, and the corporations, a different kind of mafia, was coming in. Okay. And, yeah. <laughs> and so and and so so uh they were doing away with the the bands because in, when i first when i first went there i worked at the desert inn we had a full band there you know and they had strings and the, you know the jazz oh you know, very the cool saxophone the whole thing and they did star policy there so so uh you know the the bands the big bands were just part of the uh you know part of of the makeup of the showrooms and the in the casinos and uh, so they all, you know, the major ones all had them. Yeah. And so when, yeah. when, when people came to perform there, it was always live music. Nothing was canned or taped. And so, uh, but that all kind of fell apart. That show that, was, uh, that I, I was doing when I first went there was, was actually, it was uh, uh, Irvin and Kenneth Feld were big time producers. They produced a bunch of Broadway shows. and and uh, Disney on Ice and all that kind of stuff. And they were also Siegfried and, Roy's, Siegfried and Roy's producer. Well, they were, were the producers of this show. But when we were in the course of this show, uh, the culinary union went on strike and the stage hands union went on strike. And so the musicians walked with them. Well, that was the beginning of it, the end. They just, you know, and they started putting in piped in music and, and it was never the same. Okay. And then, and to, to, uh, then, uh, in, uh, uh, when was it? Uh, 19, 1988, I guess. The, the, Musicians were trying to negotiate a contract, and they were not getting what they wanted. And the stagehand union and the culinary union didn't walk with them. Oh, okay. So, so that killed it. I mean, there was a the, on Duke Ellington Street. There, there was a, a, a the musicians, uh, you know, hall was there. Like the uh, the union hall was there, and they had big bands playing twenty four hours around the clock. People could write stuff and bring it in and just put it on the bandstand and have it played right away. You know? Oh wow, very cool. And, and, and so it was pretty amazing. It was it was very cool, and the musicians that were coming in and out of there were fantastic. There's a lot of musicians that settled down in Las Vegas were were musicians that toured with Kenton and Basie and you know uh, Ellington. And, I mean, these were amazing people. They just got tired of of touring and wanted yeah. families and stuff, so they settled down in, in Vegas. Okay, so uh, very cool. Yeah, I didn't know a lot of the history of that, like the kind of the big band era down there and um yeah very cool yeah yeah i was i was i was uh, lucky to to experience some of that there was one godfather there when i when i moved there left and he was the last of the last of the the you know the italians from chicago and he, he died you know while i was living there but but uh, so it was really the transition from the mafia to the, and and the mafia really treated the musicians very well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Very cool. So then you were living down in Las Vegas and and doing this. Then what? Where'd you go after that? Um, I I toured. You know, I I toured from there too. But plus I did. You know, I did a show at the, du the Desert Inn. I did a Latino Royale at the Dunes. I did uh, Legends in Concert at the, at the Imperial Palace. I did Jubilee at Bally's Grand. I did Country Tonight at the Aladdin. I did X, uh, uh, over at the Excalibur, I did King Arthur's Tournament. And, uh, and then I had my own band, too. So <laughs> I did all those, all those shows. Uh, and then I toured, too, from there. Okay. So... so uh, uh, mainly with different companies, but I uh, Legends and Concert toured the East Coast and went to Broadway for a while, 
and uh, and then uh, but. Uh, after I, I met my wife, and we ended up, she lived up here in, in the Northwest, and we uh, ended up getting married in 97, 1997. Okay. And so, so I moved up here because she had two children, and uh, there, you know, I didn't want to take the... Uh, the my my stepdaughter was 11 and I didn't want her to have to leave her being in the area where her dad was yeah okay so I came up so I came up here but then I didn't know what to do with I suppose we were living in Machias so am I supposed to like perform for the raccoons or what you know <laughs> uh, so it was a little bit crazy but but uh, then we went out to the east coast to Washington DC and and I played in a whole uh, probably five or six uh, big bands there. And my favorite was Doc Dykeman's big band. And he uh, had a bunch of people that were from the Platters, which was the elite band for the military, their jazz band. Okay. And they liked playing in Doc's band because he had a great book. And so I, I, played, I played next to some, some, just some of the best musicians in the world. Oh, very cool. Yeah, that was amazing. That's awesome. So that what part of the East Coast were you guys living in? Washington D.C. area. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So we were th- we were there. Uh, you know, it was it was kind of uh, interesting because we were there when Obama was elected. You know, and there was a lot of interesting politics going on. But uh, but I was spending a lot of time playing music. Okay. And I was I also did, I also taught at a ballroom dance studio there too. Okay. So, yeah. Nice. Was there a specific um, focus you had in the ballroom like a, a type of ballroom dancing or were you kind of teaching a, a, a big array of them? Yeah, I was teaching the Latin the dances, you know, the salsa and the tango and rumba. And and then I was also t- teaching the ballroom, you know, waltz and foxtrot and you know, quick step and you know, all those things too. And I also taught East Coast swing as well. Oh, very cool. Okay, yeah. My uh, my wife and I have. Uh, I mean, we kind of got to know each other through dancing, and so oh, cool. like um, throughout you know our life, we've done a lot of swing dance. Um, we've done both East and West Coast. Um, we actually used to go to the uh, the Cook Road Grange. Um, uh, Kim is the teacher there. Mm-hmm. And um, so she used to do a bunch of different dances. Like each month has its own theme of dances. And so uh, we would go up there. And so we learned a bunch of like um, different dances from her. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I've heard about her. And I, I guess she draws quite a crowd there, too. Yeah, she has quite a loyal following up there. So um, that's actually where I proposed to my wife as well. So we, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So, so you look at, yeah, uh, dance is just a lot of fun. It really, it really is. And, yeah. uh, you know, you can have, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's just a, a wonderful therapeutic thing to do. And it sounds like it brought your wife and you together too. So that's a great thing. Yeah. Yeah, and we actually got to go to the the latest one you guys put on um, at the community center. Oh, uh, the dance, you mean? Yeah. Yep. Were you there? Were you there for the which was the last? Was that the Valentine's dance? Yes, that did? that's what it was. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I direct that band. That's my my big band, and I play sax, clarinet, and flute in that band. Okay. And then I also teach sometimes like. This next dance that was supposed to happen on the 11th of April, uh, our usual uh, dance teacher team, uh, their husband and wife, uh, Aleph and Joy, uh, they uh, were going to be in Panama. So I, and I do this on occasion too, I go in and I, besides the fact that I set up the bandstand, I do the sound and then, uh, you know, we got to do sound check. And and then I teach the 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 dance class prior to the to the dance. Okay. And then I teach them on the inter, during intermissions too. Yeah. So so uh, so that makes for a busy night for me. <laughs> You're wearing all the hats. Yeah, yeah, wearing them all. Okay, very cool. So yeah, let's. Um, how did you get started with? Or I guess where did the idea come from for Forte MDA? And what does the 
MDA stand for? A music, dance, art. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, the idea was when we were looking on about moving up here because we want to get back up northwest to be near the kids. Uh, then we, we were in the Washington D.C. area, and we were looking at at you know different places here on the island, and we've got some friends that live next to us in Machias, so we're really close friends of us, of ours, and we were looking you know at real estate, and we had a real estate agent that was kind of sending us stuff, and so I I you know they they sent us uh, information about the this you know area here where the where the where Forte Music Dance Art is located, and there's also four condominiums here, yeah, and made by made by the same contractor. And so what happened was he was building them in 2007, and uh, we all know what happened in 2008. Well, <laughs> yeah, he, he lost his shirt. He couldn't sell them because he was going to try to sell them at the high end. And so we were watching this over the next few years, and nothing sold, and they kept dropping in price. Okay. So what inter- interested me about this property was that, that the building was a zone commercial residential. Yeah. So, so I thought, wow, you could live there and you could also have a, have a, a business, you know. And so for me, I thought, well, I've, I've had two. I thought, well, what can I do, you know, in a business? that wasn't a grocery store was there before, and that's what it was intended to be. Yeah. But... Yep. but uh, the contractor was not able to finish that building, so it was just dirt floor. There wasn't there wasn't anything. It was just the the frame, you know. Yeah. So so, uh, which was also attractive to me because I knew I could build what I wanted to in there. So uh, so the idea was I would I was thinking it would be nice at this point in my life to pass on what I've uh, learned, uh, you know, in my entire lifetime. Uh, to to students and I taught on the East Coast to uh, uh, music and I taught in Vegas as well. Yeah. So I thought, well, why why not ha- put together my own little Allied Art facility? Uh, I went to Corning School of Allied Arts. I went to Juilliard in New York, which was an Allied Art school. So I thought, why don't I just have my own little Juilliard here on the north end of Camino Island? Yeah. So, <laughs> so what's what does Allied Art? Um, for those who don't know, and myself included in that, it, uh, allied art means that it, it's uh, it, you're you're um, putting the all the arts together, like the visual arts and the you know the the uh, performing arts and uh, you know like music and dance and yeah and, okay and acting and all that stuff. You so they're allied, right? I get they're it. Okay. So so I thought, well. You know, this building is kind of, you know, it, to do what I wanted to do, it's it's not it's not huge, you know. So, but I'm I can, think I can make it work. So I designed, uh, you know, the uh, my wife and I designed the 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 way it was going to be, and then I I sort of brainstormed all the just logistics because there's a lot of electrical stuff that had to go in there to make it work. Yeah, and. So on the downstairs area, I have ballet, uh, ballet bars and a, a floating sprung dance floor. There's no nails in it. I have ballet mirrors. I have a projector that I can uh, and a big screen that I can uh, film students so they can look and you know make the corrections and stuff when they're working on choreography. I have a 24 track Mackie mixer in there. I have JBL professional speakers and a big huge subwoofer for the musicians that come in i have quadraphonic speakers in the ceilings and there's a little kitchenette down there and i have a handicap accessible bathroom in there too very cool and, uh, and so the, it's it's you know it was really a kind of oh and i also have led lights hanging in there all the wiring went through the ceiling and through the walls uh, I have a snake going from the 24-track mixer to the the performance area, so nobody has to run cables on the floor. And uh, we turned the, that studio into a, 
a performance gallery at night. We've had jazz concerts, folk concerts, uh, rock concerts. We've had old-time radio shows in there. We've had uh, contemporary theater companies. We've had opera. We've had Shakespeare. We've had receptions, even weddings. So we've, okay. We've done all kinds of stuff in there. Oh, that's but, very uh, cool. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's, that's the downstairs. And then the upstairs, I have an art gallery where I represent 10 artists. And I also have my work up there. So I have my drawings and paintings and mixed media and photography up there. Wow. So, so yeah, you never got to see my, my drawings or mixed media. I think I mainly had photography over there at Naked City. Yeah. But, uh, um, but, uh, but I, that, that I show my work up there and, uh, as well as some of the artists are local, some are from Seattle. Sometimes I get international artists in there too. Okay. And then the music studio is upstairs. So I teach sax, clarinet, flute, voice, and piano there. In the ballet, in the dance studio, I teach ballet, tap, jazz, and ballroom dancing. And I have other teachers that, I have other ballet teachers that teach for me. I have another tap teacher that teaches advanced and beginning tap. And I have a highland dance teacher in there. And I also have uh, yoga okay. teachers. Okay. Wow. So, you got everyone in there. <laughs> Not everyone, but <laughs> we, we have a nice crew. That's very cool. Yeah, because that's actually, so yeah, where your location is. As a kid, so I grew up on Camino. We moved here in 1995. And, uh, ah, there, penny, penny candy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, there wasn't a lot to do. And we lived on the north end of the island. So me and my friends, we would always just ride our bikes down to the little store by the bay that was used to be located there. Yeah. And um yeah, so that's that's funny. And I actually haven't even I haven't been into the actual complex and stuff since it's been built. Um so Oh, you have to come over and visit. I'm uh you know, it was really funny, Brandon, is that that the, the believe it or not, I mean, that thing was torn down like in 2006 or something like that. Yeah. And I would have people come, you know, wanting, you know, like clam chowder and you know <laughs> barbecued chicken and and penny candy and you know, people are all upset that it was that it was not a, a you know where where did that go we want that back <laughs> you know? and so they, they, these are adults like you you know that experienced that when they were kids you know coming yeah. there and getting a little penny candy so uh so so there were and it was amazing how to me how many years later people still showed up you know yep yeah, no, it was a it was a landmark for the time that it was there for sure. You know, I had a lady stop by the studio, and I don't even know who she was because I wasn't there when she came by. But she dropped off a photograph of that little store, so I have I know what it looked like now, and and uh, you know I have that in the studio. Oh, very cool. Yeah, no, that was definitely a, a place we stopped frequently. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. So then, uh, what do you now that you've got you know Forte MDA and, and everything going? What do you see as the future of the studio? You know, it, we we will continue to keep things going, and and uh, you know uh, we might add some uh, some different like add some modern dance. I was actually when I was at Juilliard, that was really a modern dance program. Okay. However, I haven't taught any modern dance here, uh, but but we might add some of that. Uh, I like to have different. Uh, uh, yoga teachers that teach various different styles of yoga, so we'll probably add that. And I would like to get some some because uh, uh, I'm doing all the uh, all the instrumental uh, teach, but I teach the woodwinds and, and piano and voice. Yeah. So it'd be nice to have. I've had people requesting uh, guitar, of course, and and the violin. And uh, so it would be, and and brass instruments too. So, so it'd be nice to add some uh, some of that along the way if if we can. And we'll just continue to do performances uh, in the evenings, like we have done, and and bring in different uh, uh, groups and ensembles and stuff uh, along the way. 
Yeah, very cool. All right. Well, I like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. So the first okay. one, the first one is: Do you have a lesser known or favorite location on Kamano Island that you like to hang out? Yes, uh, and I don't know that it's lesser known, but it's uh, one of, one of my favorite spots is the English Boom Trail. Yeah. And the reason is because there's, you know, kingfishers down there. There's uh, great blue herons, you know, fishing on the in the Utsalati Bay, but they're also fishing in the freshwater in the wetlands. And then there's that eagle nest right there when you park. Yeah. <laughs> right up above, you know. And yeah. uh, I've, I've followed those eagles for about six years now. And when they were in the nest up in the woods, it was, that, and that was quite a story how that all fell apart. But, but anyway, so I go there and, and, I, and I do a lot of my photography there too. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. We used to live on the other end of that road um, on Tillicum Way. Uh, we were the first house inside of that gated area. Oh, oh, is that right? Yeah, so yeah. we used to look over the bluff and I mean there was there was times that we could see multiple eagles nests in just all of the and they were all at right at eye level cuz you know the trees were down below and grew upward. So by the time they got to the nest they were all at eye level of us. Oh yeah. So it was yeah, it was pretty crazy. Fantastic. Yeah, so, that's fantastic. So, yeah. All right. Um, pretend you have a friend coming from out of town uh, who hasn't been here before. What would their first stay look like here? Well, if I, if I had, you mean on the island? Yeah. Well, I would bring them over to the commons <laughs> <laughs> and and make sure that they had some of our wonderful pastries and a coffee, of course, Mayo Island coffee. Yeah, thank uh, you. That would be how we would probably start off the day. And then we might head down to the to the state park, and do some hiking there, and then uh, work our way back up and stop at some of the different places along the way back, and then end up at the English Boom Trail. Oh yeah, very cool. All right, um, who is an interesting or fascinating person in this community that I should interview next? I, uh, I don't know who you, you've interviewed up until this point, but. Um, I would say uh, definitely Jack Gunter. Okay. Yes. I haven't interviewed him yet. Uh, he would be very fascinating for you. And, and, uh, we actually showed his documentary at Forte to oh, him. That screen cool. I told you about. Yeah. And he also takes, uh, yoga at my studio. Okay. Too. But he's, he's fascinating because he has uh, a lot of, a lot of stories to tell and he, he would definitely be a good choice. Awesome. All right. And lastly, if you could have an, uh, a message on a billboard right on uh, the hill as you're driving onto Camino Island, what would that say? Forte music dance art. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you so much. I, again, I apologize for our last week. Um, for those who don't no know, word. I dropped no the worries. ball there. So, um, no worries. But I'm glad we were able to connect. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. My pleasure. And thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Chris Tui for joining me on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And for more information about this episode, go to kamenocommons.com slash EP40. Thanks for listening and see you next time.